The High Baron, Chapter Four of Shardick by Richard Adams, read by Celeste Lawrence in September two thousand and twenty. The High Baron. It was late in the afternoon when the hunter Keldrek came at last in sight of the landmark he was seeking, a tall zoan tree some distance above the downstream point of the island. The boughs, with, with their silver-backed, fern-like leaves, hung down over the river forming an enclosed, watery arbor inshore. In front of this, the reeds had been cut to afford to one seated within a clear view across the strait. Keldrek, with some difficulty, steered his raft to the mouth of the channel, looked towards the Zoan, and raised his paddle as though in greeting. There was no response, but he expected none. Guiding the raft up to a stout post in the water, he felt down its length, found a rope running shorewards below the surface, and drew himself towards land. Reaching the tree, he pulled the raft through the curtain of pendant branches. Inside, a short wooden pier projected from the bank, and on this a man was seated, staring out between the leaves at the river beyond. Behind him a second man sat mending a net. Four or five other rafts were moored to the hidden quay. The lookout's glance, having taken in the single ketlana and a few fish lying beside Keldrick, came to rest upon the weary, blood-smeared hunter himself. So, Keldrick played with the children, you have little to show and less than usual. Where are you hurt? The shoulder, Shendron, and the arm is stiff and painful. You look like a man in a stupor. Are you feverish? The hunter made no reply. I asked, are you feverish? He shook his head. What caused the wound? Keldrek hesitated, then shook his head once more and remained silent. You simpleton, do you suppose I am asking you for the sake of gossip? I have to learn everything, you know that. Was it a man or an animal that gave you that wound? I fell and injured myself. The Shendron waited. A leopard pursued me, added Keldrick. The Shendron burst out impatiently. Do you think you are telling tales now to children on the shore? Am I to keep asking, and what came next? Tell me what happened, or would you prefer to be sent to the High Baron to say that you refused to tell? Keldrick sat on the edge of the wooden pier, looking down and stirring a stick in the dark green water below. At last the Shendron said, Keldrick! I know you are considered a simple fellow, with your cat catch a fish and all the rest of it. Whether you are indeed so simple I cannot tell, but whether or not you know well enough that every hunter who goes out has to tell all he knows upon return. Those are Belka Trezette's orders. Has the fire driven a leopard to Ortelga? Did you meet with strangers? What is the state of the western end of the island? These are the things I have to learn. Kelderek trembled where he sat but still said nothing. "'Why?' said the net-mender, speaking for the first time. "'You know he's a simpleton, Keldrick Zenzuata. Keldrick play with the children. "'He went hunting. He hurt himself. He's returned with little to show. "'Can't we leave it at that? "'Who wants the bother of taking him up to the High Baron?' "'The Shendron, an older man, frowned. "'I am not here to be trifled with. "'The island may be full of all manner of savage beasts.' Of men, too, perhaps. Why not? And this man you believe to be a simpleton, he may be deceiving us. With whom has he spoken today? And did they pay him to keep silent? But if he were deceiving us, said the net-mender, would he not come with a tale prepared? Depend upon it. He— The hunter stood up, looking tensely from one to the other. I am deceiving no one, but I cannot tell you what I have seen today. The Shendron and his companion exchanged glances. In the evening quiet, a light breeze set the water clop-clopping against the platform, and from somewhere inland sounded a faint call, Yasta, the firewood! What is this? said the Shendron. You are making difficulties for me, Keldrek, but worse, far worse for yourself. I cannot tell you what I have seen, repeated the hunter with a kind of desperation. The Shendron shrugged his shoulders. Well, Tafro, since it seems there's no curing this foolishness, you'd better take him up to the Sindrad. 
But you are a great fool, Keldrek. The High Baron's anger is a storm that many men have failed to survive before now. This I know. God's will must be done. The Shendron shook his head. Keldrek, as though in an attempt to be reconciled to him, laid a hand on his shoulder, but the other shook it off impatiently and returned in silence to his watch over the river. Tafro, scowling now, motioned the hunter to follow him up the bank. The town that covered the narrow eastern end of the island was fortified on the landward side by an intricate defense system, part natural and part artificial, that ran from shore to shore. West of the Zoan tree, on the further side from the town, four lines of pointed stakes extended from the waterside into the woods. Inland, the patches of thicker jungle formed obstacles capable of little improvement, though even here the living creepers had been pruned and trained into almost impenetrable screens, one behind another. In the more open parts, thorn bushes had been planted, Trisada, Curlspike, and the terrible Ancotlia, whose poison burns and irritates until men tear their own flesh with their nails. Steep places had been made steeper, and at one point the outfall of a marsh had been dammed to form a shallow lake, shrunk at this time of year, in which small alligators, caught on the mainland, had been set free to grow and become dangerous. Along the outer edge of the line lay the so-called dead belt, about eighty yards broad, which was never entered except by those whose task it was to maintain it. Here were hidden trip ropes, fastened to props holding up great logs, concealed pits filled with pointed stakes, one containing snakes, spikes in the grass, and one or two open, smooth-looking paths leading to enclosed places, into which arrows and other missiles could be poured from platforms constructed among the trees above. The belt was divided by rough palisades, so that advancing enemies would find lateral movement difficult and discover themselves to, committed to emerge at points where they could be awaited. The entire line and its features blended so naturally with the surrounding jungle that a stranger, though he might here and there perceive that men had been at work, could form little idea of its full extent. This remarkable closure of an open flank, devised and carried out during several years by the high baron, Belka Trezette, had never yet been put to the proof. But, as Belka Trezette himself had perhaps foreseen, the labor of making it, and the knowledge that it was there, had created among the Ortelgans a sense of confidence and security that was probably worth as much as the works themselves. The line not only protected the town, but made it a great deal harder for anyone to leave it without the High Baron's knowledge. Kelderek and Tafro, turning their backs on the belt, made their way toward the town along a narrow path between the hemp fields. Here and there women were carrying up water from among the reeds, or manuring ground already harvested and gleaned. At this hour there were few workers, however, for it was nearly supper time. Not far away, beyond the trees, threads of smoke were curling into the evening sky, and with them, from somewhere along the edge of the huts, rose the song of a woman. He came, he came by night. I wore red flowers in my hair. I have left my lamp alight. My lamp is burning. Senendril Nakora, Senendril Naro. There was an undisguised warmth and satisfaction in the voice. Kelderek glanced at Tafro, jerked his head in the direction of the song, and smiled. Aren't you afraid? asked Tafro in a surly tone. The grave, preoccupied look returned into Kelderek's eyes. To go before the High Baron and say that you persisted in refusing to tell the Shendrin what you know? You must be mad. Why be such a fool? Because this is no matter for concealment or lying. God... He broke off. Tafro made no reply, but merely held out his hand for Keldrick's weapons, knife and bow. The hunter handed them to him without a word. They came to the first huts with their cooking, smoke, and refuse smells. Men were returning from the day's work, and women, standing at their doors, were calling to children or gossiping with neighbors. Though one or two looked curiously at Kelderek, trudging acquiescently behind the Shendrin's messenger, none spoke to him or called out to ask where they were going. Suddenly a child, a boy, perhaps seven or eight years old, ran up and took his hand. The hunter stopped. 
Kildurek, asked the child, are you coming to play this evening? Kildurek hesitated. Why, I can't say. No, Saren, I don't think I shall be able to come this evening. Why not? asked the child, plainly disappointed. You've hurt your shoulder, is that it? There's something I've got to go and tell the High Baron, replied Kelderick simply. Another older boy who had joined them burst out laughing. And I have to see the Lord of Bekla before dawn, a matter of life and death. Kelderick, don't tease us. Don't you want to play tonight? Come on, can't you? said Taffro impatiently, shuffling his feet in the dust. No, it's the truth, said Kelderick, ignoring him. I'm on my way to see the High Baron. But I'll be back. Either tonight or, well, another night, I suppose. He turned away, but the boys trotted beside him as he walked on. We were playing this afternoon, said the little boy. We were playing cat catch a fish. I got the fish home twice. Well done, said the hunter, smiling down at him. Be off with you, cried Taffro, making as though to strike at them. Come on, get out. You great dunderheaded fool, he added to Kildrick as the boys ran off. "'Playing games with children at your age.' "'Good night,' called Kelderick after them. "'The good night you pray for, who knows?' "'They waved to him and were gone among the smoky huts. "'A man passing by spoke to Kelderick, but he made no reply, "'only walking on abstractedly, his eyes on the ground. "'At length, after crossing a wide area of rope walks, "'the two approached a group of larger huts,' standing in a rough semicircle not far from the eastern point and its broken causeway. Between these, trees had been planted, and the sound of the river mingled with the evening breeze and the movement of the leaves to give a sense of refreshing coolness after the hot, dry day. Here, not only women were at work. A number of men, who seemed by their appearance and occupations to be both servants and craftsmen, were trimming arrows, sharpening stakes, and repairing bows, spears, and axes. A burly smith, who had just finished for the day, was climbing out of his forge in a shallow open pit, while his two boys quenched the fire and tidied up after him. Kelderick stopped and turned once more to Taffro. Badly aimed arrows can wound innocent men. There's no need for you to be hinting and gossiping about me to these fellows. Why should you care? I don't want them to know that I'm keeping a secret, said Kilderick. Taffro nodded curtly and went up to a man who was cleaning a grindstone, the water flying off in a spiral as he spun the wheel. Shendrin's messenger, where is Belka Trezette? He? Eating. The man jerked his thumb towards the largest of the huts. I have to speak to him. If it'll wait, replied the man, you'd do better to wait. Ask Numis. The red-haired fellow, when he comes out, he'll let you know when Belkatrezet's ready. Neolithic man, the bearded Assyrian, the wise Greeks, the howling Vikings, the Tartars, the Aztecs, the Samurai, the Cavaliers, the Anthropophagy, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders, there is one thing at least that all have known in common, waiting until someone of importance has been ready to see them. Numis, chewing a piece of fat as he listened to Taffro, cut him short, pointing him and Kelderek to a bench against the wall. There they sat. The sun sank until its rim touched the horizon upstream. The flies buzzed. Most of the craftsmen went away. Taffro dozed. The place became almost deserted, until the only sound above that of the water was the murmur of voices from inside the big hut. At last, Numis came out and shook Taffro by the shoulder. The two rose and followed the servant through the door, on which was painted Belkotrezet's emblem, a golden snake. The hut was divided into two parts. At the back were Belkotrezet's private quarters. The larger part, known as the Sindrad, served as both council chamber and mess hall for the barons. Except when a full council was summoned, it was seldom that all the barons were assembled at once. There were continual journeys to the mainland for hunting expeditions and trade, for the island had no iron or other metal except what could be imported from the Gelt Mountains in exchange for skins, feathers, semi-precious stones, and such artifacts as arrows and rope, whatever, in fact, had any exchange value. 
apart from the barons and those who attended upon them. All hunters and traders had to obtain leave to come and go. The barons, as often as they returned, were required to report their news like anyone else, and, while living on the island, usually ate the evening meal with Belka Trezette in the Sindrat. Some five or six faces turned towards Tafro and Keldrek as they entered. The meal was over, and a debris of bones, rinds, and skins littered the floor. A boy was collecting this refuse into a basket, while another sprinkled fresh sand. Four of the barons were still sitting on the benches, holding their drinking horns and leaning their elbows on the table. Two, however, stood apart near the doorway, evidently to get the last of the daylight, for they were talking in low tones over an abacus of beads and a piece of smooth bark covered with writing. This seemed to be some kind of list or inventory, for as Kelderick passed, one of the two barons, looking at it, said, "'No twenty-five ropes, no more.' whereupon the other moved back a bead with his forefinger and replied, "'And you have twenty-five ropes fit to go, have you?' Kelderek and Tafro came to a stop before a young, very tall man with a silver torque on his left arm. When they entered, he had his back to the door, but now he turned to look at them, holding his horn in one hand and sitting somewhat unsteadily on the table with his feet on the bench below. He looked Kelderek up and down with a bland smile, but said nothing. Confused, Kelderek lowered his eyes. The young baron's silence continued, and the hunter, by way of keeping himself in countenance, tried to fix his attention on the great table, which he had heard described, but never before seen. It was old, carved with a craftsmanship beyond the skill of any carpenter or woodworker now alive on Ortelga. Each of the eight legs was pyramidal in shape, its steeply tapering sides forming a series of steps or ledges, one above another to the apex. The two corners of the board that he could see had the likeness of bears' heads, snarling, with open jaws and muzzles thrust forward. They were most lifelike. Kelderek trembled and looked quickly up again. "'And what extra work you come to give us?' asked the young baron cheerfully. "'Want fellows repair causeways at it?' "'No, my lord,' said Numis in a low voice. "'This is the man who refused to tell his news to the Shendrin.' "'Eh?' asked the young baron, emptying his horn and beckoning to a boy to refill it. "'Man was Shench, then. No use talking Shendrin's stupid fellows. "'All Shendrin's stupid fellows, eh?' he said to Keldrek. "'My lord,' replied Keldrek, "'believe me, I have nothing against the Shendrin, but—but but the matter—can you read?' interrupted the young baron. Read? No, my lord. Neither can I. Look at old Fassel Hasta there. What's he reading? Who knows? You watch out. He'll be with you. The baron with the piece of bark turned with a frown and stared at the young man, as much to say that he was, at any rate, not one to act the fool in his cups. I'll tell you, said the young baron, sliding forward from the table and landing with a jolt on the bench. All about writing. One word. Taco Minion, called a harsh voice from the further room. I want to speak with those men. Zelda, bring them in. Another baron rose from the bench opposite, beckoning to Kelderek and Tafro. They followed him out of the Sindrad and into the room beyond, where the high baron was sitting alone. Both, in token of submission and respect, bent their heads, raised the palms of their hands to their brows, lowered their eyes, and waited. Kelderek, who had never previously come before Belka Trezette, had been trying to prepare himself for the moment when he would have to do so. To confront him was in itself an ordeal, for the high baron was sickeningly disfigured. His face, if face it could still be called, looked as though it had once been melted and left to set again. Below the white-seamed forehead, the left eye, askew and fallen horribly down the cheek, was half buried under a great humped ridge of flesh running from the bridge of the nose to the neck. The jaw was twisted to the right, so that the lips closed crookedly, while across the chin stretched a livid scar, in shape roughly resembling a hammer. Such expression as there was upon this terrible mask was sardonic, penetrating, proud, and detached, 
that of a man indestructible, a man to survive treachery, siege, desert, and flood. The high baron, seated on a round stool like a drum, stared up at the hunter. In spite of the heat, he was wearing a heavy fur cloak, fastened at the neck with a brass chain, so that his ghastly head resembled that of an enemy severed and fixed on top of a black tent. For some moments there was silence, a silence like a drawn bowstring. Then Belka Trezette said, "'What is your name?' His voice, too, was distorted, harsh and low, with an odd ring, like the sound of a stone bounding over a sheet of ice. Kelderek, my lord, why are you here? The Shendron at the Zoan sent me. That I know. Why did he send you? Because I did not think it right to tell him what befell me today. Why does the Shendron waste my time? said Belka Trezette to Taffro. Could he not make this man speak? Are you telling me he defied you both? He, the hunter, this man, my lord, stammered Taffro. He told us, that is, he would not tell us. The Shendron, he asked him about, about his injury. He replied that a leopard pursued him, but he would tell us no more. When we demanded to know, he said he could tell us nothing. There was a pause. He refused us, my lord persisted Tafro. We said to him, Be silent. Belka Trezette paused, frowning abstractedly and pressing two fingers against the ridge beneath his eye. At length he looked up. You are a clumsy liar, Kelderek, it seems. Why trouble to speak of a leopard? Why not say you fell out of a tree? I told the truth, my lord. There was a leopard. And this injury went on Belcatrezette, reaching out his hand to grasp Kelderek's left wrist, and gently moving his arm in a way that suggested that he might pull it a good deal harder if he chose. This trifling injury. You had it, perhaps, from someone who was disappointed that you had not brought him better news? Perhaps you told him the Shindrons are alert, surprise would be difficult, and he was displeased? No, my lord. Well, we shall see. There was a leopard then, and you fell. What happened then? Kelderek said nothing. Is this man a half-wit? asked Belka Trezette, turning to Zelda. Why, my lord, replied Zelda, I know little of him, but I believe he is known for something of a simple fellow. They laugh at him. He plays with the children. He does what? He plays with the children, my lord, on the shore. What else? Otherwise, he is solitary, as hunters often are. He lives alone and harms no one, as far as I know. His father had hunters' rights to come and go, and he has been allowed to inherit them. If you wish, we can send to find out more. Do so, said Belka Trezette, and then to Taffro, you may go. Taffro snatched his palm to his forehead and was gone like a candle flame in the wind. Zelda followed him with more dignity. Now, Kelderek said the twisted mouth, slowly. You are an honest man, you say, and we are alone, so there is nothing to hinder you from telling your story. Sweat broke out on Kelderek's face. He tried to speak, but no words came. Why did you tell the Shendron a few words and then refuse to tell more? said the High Baron. What foolishness was that? A rogue should know how to cover his tracks. If there was something you wished to conceal, why did you not invent some tale that would satisfy the Shendron? Because, because the truth, the hunter hesitated. Because I was afraid, and I am still afraid. He stopped and then burst out suddenly. Who can lie to God? Belka Trezette watched him as a lizard watches a fly. Zelda, he called suddenly. The Baron returned. Take this man out, put his arm in a sling, and let him eat. Bring him back in half an hour, and then buy this knife, Kelderek. And he drove the point of his dagger into the golden snake painted on the lid of the chest beside him. You shall tell me what you know. The unpredictable nature of dealings with Belka Trezette were the subject of many a tale. With Zelda's hand under his shoulder, 
Kildrek stumbled out into the Sindrad and sat huddled on a bench while the boys brought him food and a leather sling. When next he faced Belka Trezette, night had fallen. The Sindrad outside was quiet, for all but two of the barons had gone to their own quarters. Zelda sat in the firelight, looking over some arrows which the Fletcher had brought. Fassel Hasta was hunched on another bench at the table, slowly writing with an inked brush on bark by the light of a smoky earthenware lamp. A lamp was burning also on the lid of Belkatrezet's chest. In the shadows beyond, two fireflies went winking about the room. A curtain of wooden beads had been let fall over the doorway, and from time to time these clicked quietly in the night breeze. The distortion of Belkatrezet's face seemed like a trick of the lamplight. The features, monstrous as a devil mask in a play, the nose appearing to extend to the neck in a single unbroken line, the shadows under the jaw pulsing slightly and rhythmically, like the throat of a toad. And indeed, it was a play they were now to act, thought Kildrek, for it accorded with nothing in life as he had known it. A plain man, seeking only his living, and neither wealth nor power, had been mysteriously singled out and made an instrument to cross the will of Belka Trezette. "'Well, Kildrek," said the High Baron, pronouncing his name with a slight emphasis that somehow conveyed contempt, "'while you have been filling your belly, I have learned as much as there is to be known about a man like you. All, that is, but what you are going to tell me now, Kildrek Zenzuara. Do you know they call you that?' "'Yes, my lord.' Kildrek play with the children.' A solitary young man, with no taste for taverns, it seems, and an unnatural indifference towards girls, but known nevertheless for a skilful hunter who often brings in game and rarities for the factors trading with Gelt and Thecla. If you have heard so much, my lord, so that he is allowed to come and go alone, much as he pleases, with no questions asked, sometimes he is gone for several days at a time, is he not? "'It is necessary, my lord, if the game—' "'Why do you play with the children? "'A young man, unmarried, what sort of nonsense is that?' "'Kelderek considered. "'Children often need friends,' he said. "'Some of the children I play with are unhappy. "'Some have been left with no parents. "'Their parents have deserted them.' "'He broke off in confusion, "'meeting the gaze of Belkadrezet's distorted eye over the ridges.' After some minutes, he muttered uncertainly, "'The flames of God.' "'What? What did you say?' "'The flames of God, my lord. Children, their eyes and ears are still open. They speak the truth.' "'And so shall you, Keldrek, before you are done. You'd be thought a simple fellow then, soft in the head, perhaps, a stranger to drink and wenches, playing with children and given to talk of God, for no one would suspect such a man, would he, of spying, of treachery, of carrying messages or treating with enemies on his lonely hunting expeditions. My lord, until one day he returns injured and almost empty-handed from a place believed to be full of game, too much confused to have been able to invent a tale. My lord, the hunter fell on his knees. Did you displease the man, Keldrick? Was that it? Some brigand from Dealguy, perhaps, or a slimy slave trader from Terconalt out to make a little money by carrying messages during his dirty travels. Your information was displeasing, perhaps, or the pay was not enough. No, my lord, no. Stand up. The beads clicked in a gust that flattened the lamp flame and made the shadows dart on the wall like fish startled in a deep pool. The high baron was silent collecting himself with the air of a man repulsed by an obstacle, but still determined to overcome it by one means or another. When he spoke again, it was in a quieter tone. "'Well, so far as I am any judge, Keldrek, you may be an honest man, though you are a great fool with your talk of children and God. Could you not have asked for one single friend to come here to testify to your honesty?' "'My lord?' "'No, you could not, it seems.' or else it never occurred to you. But let us assume that you are honest, and that something took place today, which for some reason you have neither concealed nor revealed. If you had gone about with cunning to conceal it altogether, I suppose you would not have been compelled to come here. 
you would not be standing here now. No doubt, then, you know very well that it is something that is bound to come to light sooner or later, so that it would have been foolish for you to try to hide it. Yes, I am sure enough of that, my lord, replied Keldrick without hesitation. Belcatrizet drew his knife, and, like a man idly passing the time while waiting for supper or a friend, began to heat the point in the lamp flame. My lord, said Keldrick suddenly, if a man were to return from hunting, and say to the Shendron, or to his friends, I have found a star fallen from the sky to the earth, who would believe him? Belka Trezette made no reply, but went on turning the point of the knife in the flame. But if that man had indeed found a star, my lord, what then? What should he do, and to whom should he bring it? You question me, and in riddles, Kelderek, do you? I have no love for visionaries or their talk, so be careful. The high baron clenched his fist, but then, like a man determined to exercise patience, let it fall open, and remained staring at Calderac with a skeptical look. Well, he said at length, I fear you, my lord. I fear your power and your anger, but the star that I found is from God, and this too I fear. I fear it more. I know to whom it must be revealed. His voice came in a strangled gasp. I can reveal it only to the Tuginda. In an instant, Belkadrezet had seized him by the throat and forced him to the floor. The hunter's head bent sharply backwards, away from the hot knife point, thrust close to his face. I will do this. I can do only that. By the bear, you will no longer choose what you will do when your bow eye is out. You'll end up in Zeray, my child. Kelderick's hands stretched upwards, clutching at the black cloak bending over him and pressing him backwards from knee to wounded shoulder. His eyes were closed against the heat of the knife, and he seemed about to faint in the high baron's grasp. Yet when at length he spoke, Belka Josette, stooping close to catch the words, he whispered, "'It can be only as God wills, my lord. The matter is great, greater even than your hot knife.' The beads clashed in the doorway. Without relinquishing his hold, the baron peered over his shoulder into the gloom beyond the lamp. Zelda's voice said, My lord, there are messengers from the Tuginda. She would speak with you urgently, she says. She requests that you go to Kiso tonight. Belka Trezette drew in his breath with a hiss and stood straight, shaking off Keldrek, who fell his length and lay without moving. The knife slipped from the high baron's hand and stuck in the floor, transfixing a fragment of some greasy rubbish which began to smolder with an evil smell. He stooped quickly, recovered the knife, and trod out the fragment. Then he said quietly, To Kiso, tonight. What can this mean? God protect us, are you sure? Yes, my lord. Would you speak yourself with the girls who brought the message? Yes. No, let it be. She would not send such a message unless... Go and tell Ancre and Farron to get a canoe ready, and see that this man is put aboard. This man, my lord, put aboard. The bead curtain clashed once more as the high baron passed through it, across the Sindrad, and out among the trees beyond. Zelda, hurrying across to the servants' quarters, could see in the light of the quarter moon the conical shape of the great fur cloak, striding impatiently up and down the shore.